Welcome, a really warm welcome to everybody to this evening's Bite Size Canine Anatomy. It's great, so many of you have attended um, this evening and from all over the world, it's fantastic. Now it looks a little bit different, I know, so I've got a few announcements, really important announcements, but the first one that I want to say is a huge heartfelt thank you for all the emails, all the messages that I've had over the last several months, particularly as we've been doing our bite-sized canine anatomy fortnightly um, when we've all been shut down. And I'm just so overwhelmed and, and incredibly grateful and feel really humbled and thank you so much. Please do keep sending in your emails, your um, requests for topics, anything you want to say, but I'm going to be very interested to hear from you about our new styled bite-sized canine anatomy. As you can see, it's looking very different. Now, lots of people who are coming this evening we've, who've come before, that's fantastic. So you'll know your way around Crowdcast, but we've got some new people coming in as well. So a really warm welcome to you. So just a little bit about the Crowdcast platform, which we're using. It's a little bit different to some others and I loved it. My first one was in October, 2018. And I think I was one of the very first people in the UK to use Crowdcast as a webinar platform. And so I love the idea that it is a community. It's a really community led um, sort of experience. And for me, that's really important. And I wanted to reach all the very important and special people that I've been privileged to meet over my career of 38 years as a physiotherapist. Um, and, you know, 25 years of those as a hydrotherapist as well. So I've been so fortunate to share so many moments with so many special people. And this platform gives me that. I can reach that. You can ask questions. You can have the replay straight away after. So my first announcement this evening is that we are going to continue doing our free monthly bite size anatomy or bite size canine topic. So we're going to open it up to some other topics as well, but we'll keep coming back to the anatomy because I love that so much as well. So the first announcement, we're going to keep using Crowdcast. So just to get you a bit all organized around it, we have the chat box down in the bottom right. That's where you can give your feedback, say hi to each other, share information. And I'd just like to say thank you so much to Sarah. She's remotely running the chat box for me, which is so helpful because as you can see, we're using some new tech. So the next thing I want to um, just call to your attention is if you look along the bottom navigation bar, there's two places I want you to focus on. There's ask a question, which is along the middle of the bottom navigation bar, and that's where you can place your questions um, during the event, and I will try and make sure we cover all of those. Now they're timestamped, so you can go back and see the question rather than seeing the whole replay if you want. And also you can vote them. So if you put something in there or you see another question, you can vote and that will um, upvote it. The one to the left of it, the call to action is incredibly important. I get very enthusiastic and sometimes I forget to press the button. There's gonna be a link there. And this is really important because this is a new style bite-sized canine anatomy. I wanted to streamline it because we get so many questions about the PDF, access to materials. So I found a new piece of tech, which I think is brilliant. It's an organic living dynamic page. So this is a public page. What we're going to look at today, which includes some extra new things that I'm going to announce to you, is the page you can access. So the link in call to action will take you directly to this page if you would like to be able to access it with all the links in it. Um, so it's not going to be having different kind of formats. And I know there's a huge, um, there's a huge effort at the moment with lots of people putting online courses with PDFs. And I just wanted to kind of move away from those slides. I wanted something that really was a gateway for you to access this kind of community information. So I hope you like it and I'll be really interested in your feedback on that. So let's get started. Now you just have to bear with me because as it's new tech, I, this is my first time too. So welcome if it's your first time. We do have all the other canine bite size anatomy on our YouTube channel and this page will also go onto the YouTube channel tomorrow. So the call to action, it will be um, to the left of ask a question. Perhaps you can't see that, but it will be like a green button. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press it now. So all of you can just say you are able to see it. 
and that will be your link to get to this page. Hopefully, you should be able to see it now. So it's a green banner. Hopefully, you can see it. It says canine HS resource, cranial tibial muscle, and it, that's your gateway to this page that we're going to look at now. Okay, so just going on to the page, as you see, we've got that wonderful picture of Jem up at the top, keeping her eye on us. So this is all about building this collaboration and sharing. So please share your tips and advice with each other in the chat room, share any links you've got. It's about building information together and sharing it and building this canine community worldwide, which is really, really exciting. I also have 38 years of um, information and resources I want to share with you. 16 years working in the universities, um, running canine HS courses. I've got a wealth of clinical experience I want to share. And so I'm going to be using these Notion pages to build public resources. So we'll continue with the free bite size but I've also got the most amazing announcement to make at the end of the presentation. So hang in there and keep with me. So instead of slides, we're just going to slide up, hopefully. Oh, just a little bit about the CPD certificate. I get a lot of emails about that. You can claim your approved CPD certificate by going to the link on the page, which is Canine HS Courses, if you wish to. But also you can generate your own log to record your canine anatomy and CPD and how it's impacted or um, influenced your practice. So it's not a necessity, but the, it's the option. So that's the other thing we're very keen. We want to offer you choices and to empower your opportunities of building up your CPD portfolio. So hopefully that page, I've got to just come back to the screen to see what you're seeing. So I'm sort of doing this blind, but it's all exciting. So. We're looking at the cranial tibial muscle. It's a really exciting and important muscle and it's really overlooked. I don't know why. I think sometimes in the learning journey, perhaps when people get to the CRUS, they've sort of moved on to some other detail in their course, but the CRUS is the region between the stifle and the hock. And so you can see on the left picture that you've got the thigh, which is your femur bone. It's the heaviest bone in the dog. It's not the longest. The longest bone in the dog is the ulna, but it's the heaviest bone in the dog, the largest, and that represents your thigh region. Then you've got your crus, and that's represented by two bones, your tibia and your fibula. Um, the anatomic leg, it's called the anatomic leg, is the tibia, and then the smaller bone, which is on the lateral aspect, is the fibula, um, and that represents the crus. And then below the crus, we've got the pes. So the pes is your tarsus, your metatarsus, and your digits. So these are the regions of the pelvic limb. And on the forelimb, which we've had a, le a lot of um, attention on the forelimb, the scapular thoracic um, bite-sized joint, which I felt was really informative and helpful. It's a very unknown joint. And so if you haven't seen that, look at YouTube. So in that region, you've got your scapular thoracic joint, but then you've got your brachium. And the brachium is the humerus. So it's that region between your shoulder joint and your elbow. And then you have the anti-brachium on the forelimb. So the anti-brachium goes from the elbow down to the carpus. And I know that hopefully um, Sarah is going to be adding some of these words in the chat because we've got a lot of people with a second language. So we just don't want you to lose the detail. So looking on the forelimb or the thoracic limb, we've got the brachium, which is the humerus the antibrachium, which is the radius and ulna, and then we've got the manus, M-A-N-U-S, which is the carpus, the metacarpals, and the digits. But we're focusing on the pelvic limb today, and we're looking at the crus. And I want you to get really excited about the cranial tibial muscle because it's a really cool muscle. And if you want to know anything about powering, locomotion, we've got to understand the relationship between the hock extensors and the hock flexors. So we've got two main muscle groups in the CRUS. We've got the craniolateral group and the caudal group. Now we looked at some of the caudal group, that's going to be gastrocnemius. So there's another bite size on gastrocnemius, well worth the look, it's on YouTube. And um, in there, we did talk about the superficial and deep digital flexors as well, but we haven't presented anything on them by themselves yet. And, and we wait on feedback. So if you know someone's really saying, can we have a look at that? We, we'll um, base that as a topic. So on the right in that picture, really important landmarks to understand where they are. So we've got our femur, 
Now I'm hoping you can see a hand as it comes here. Do tell me if you can see that I'm here. There's your femur and that's your femoral condyle and you have your femoral condyle and epicondyle, your lateral epicondyle and condyle. And then below here, we've got the tibia. So a very important bony landmark here, the tibial tubercle. The tibial tubercle is where quadriceps femoris attaches to, so incredibly important. Now this here is the cranial border of the tibia. Now it used to be called the tibial crest, but like in all anatomy, they change names seasonally. So sometimes I'll say a term and it, it's the same meaning as another term. It just reflects when I learnt my anatomy. So I call that the tibial crest still, but I've got to remember it's now called the cranial border. And you can feel that on yours. So if you take your hand down to just below your knee, run on the top of your shin, you can feel a kind of quite a big bumpy bit. And then when you get to the top, there's a big bumpy knob. That's your tibial tubercle. So as well as that, we've got the lateral condyle of the tibia. And the reason I'm going through this is so you can get very orientated where the origin is of the cranial tibial muscle. So the lateral condyle of the tibia is all of that. And it's pretty much bisected here by something called an extensor groove. And we need to come to that because it's going to help you understand which muscles are sort of in what place in that cross, in that craniolateral group. So I'm just moving the page down. And again, you're going to have the link and you will have this page. It will be a public resource open for you. So the cranial tibial muscle, it's in the craniolateral muscle group of the canine cross, and it's an intrinsic muscle. And what that means is that its origin and insertion lies within the pelvic limb. And the group that we're looking at is the cranial tibial, which is also known as tibialis cranialis. And it's superficial, it's easily palpable. So if you again, take your hand down to your knee, stifling the dog, knee in humans, and if you just go to the, the outside of your leg, whichever leg you're on, just on the lateral aspect, you can feel your shin and just to the left of your shin, that's the human cranial tibial. But we're talking about the, the quadruped and not just any quadruped, we're talking about the dog. So understanding the biomechanics of the dog is so important. So you use canine treatment techniques not harness techniques from social media, from the horse or from the human. They have to be specific to the dog because of the way it's designed to move. So we're looking at the cranial tibial and looking at fibularis longus, which I know as perineal longus or perineus longus. So I, I might swap between the two and I apologize for that. So fibularis longus, which is a small, stout little muscle just over the head of fibula. Cranial tibial, which we're going to look at in a moment where it is, and lying between the two of them and deep to them is the long digital extensor. Um, and why I'm going through these three muscles, you'll see the relationship in the next part of this page. Don't worry about the um, other muscles. You know, they're smaller muscles. Learn the detail later. If you get this down, it just helps you so much when you're looking at your rehab programs and when you've got any dog with any kind of hock issue, really important. So we're now looking at a real shot, a close up again, if you can just give me some feedback, if you're able to see the hand on the femur. So I'm hoping you can see that. I can't see what you're seeing. So I'm doing this blind. So I've got this little hand going round. So this is your lateral femoral condyle of the femur. And there's your epicondyle of the femur. And here where the arrow's pointing, is your fossa and this is the fossa of the lateral femoral condyle of the femur and it's really important because there's a muscle that's attached to there that relates to cranial tibial and then here we've got the tibia and this is your lateral condyle of the tibia there's the head of fibula and there's the fibula bone and halfway along here, I hope you can see it's it's clear enough we put a dark background to help you it's like an indent and that's the extensor groove. It's got a really um, different name as well, the sulcus extensorius, which you may have learnt, but we'll call it the extensor groove. And I want you to just imagine you've got your thumb and you've pressed it into some plasticine. So this groove, it's a small notch, but it goes literally all the way to the lateral condyle, to the articular surface. Um, and what's if you think about it, you've got a fossa here and an extensor groove here. So this is like a passageway for a tendon. So we've got a muscle, the long digital extensor tendon, 
it comes from here. Its origin is here in this fossa of the lateral femoral condyle. And the tendon drops down through this groove so neat and then goes into the muscle belly, which lies deep to the top part, the proximal part of cranial tibial, and also perineus longus, which is a small, stout kind of muscle with a long tendon, overlaps it. So you've kind of got these three here in a relationship, the cranial tibial, the most cranial, the perineus longus or the fibularis longus is a small, stout one just over the fibula, the head of fibula and this part of the condyle, and then lying between them and hidden at the top is the long digital extensor. And the reason I've gone through this detail is because a lot of people forget that the cranial tibial muscle actually originates, it arises off the lateral aspect of this extensor groove, and we've got a tendon underneath it. So try and build your um, anatomy as a 3D picture in your mind rather than flat. It really helps you when you're selecting the kind of treatment techniques you feel are appropriate, whether it's in your land-based physiotherapy or your water-based physiotherapy, aquatic therapy or hydrotherapies, or your muscle, um, if you're looking at muscles in your massage therapist, understanding that relationship so you're really clear where you're lying. So we've got an illustrated diagram here and in green, Hopefully, again, if you can tell me, if you can see the, the page, we've got the cranial tibial. And it's kind of, look at it, it's quite flattened, quite long. And then here, this little short, stout muscle here covering the head of fibula, covering that lateral condyle, the, the caudal part of it. And then coming from the femur, there's the tendon coming down. Can you see there the long digital extensor tendon lying between the two, kind of hidden at the top and then emerges? And it's really important to understand this relationship because we can impact all of these muscles with our um, manual therapies, our movement therapies, our, our sensory work. So understanding this relationship will help you enormously. So looking on the left, on this picture on the left, there's the head of fibula. That's the cranial part of the articular margin of the lateral condyle of the tibia. And that's where cranial tibial comes from. So it doesn't come from all the lateral condyle. It only comes from the cranial aspect of the lateral condyle of the tibia, it comes from the lateral aspect of that extensor groove. And then behind it here, that's where perineus longus lies. So that cranial tibial, that green muscle, and it also comes from this, the crest of the tibia, I call it, but it's now called the cranial edge of the tibia. And if you have a look, I don't know if you can see from the picture, but it's kind of like a ski jump. It, it, the crest actually kind of comes out like a little bit of a ski jump. So it's an arched border. So this is where the cranial tibial arises from. So let's move down to some of our models that we've been enjoying making. They take a lot longer than we realize, but they're great fun. And um, we're going to try and catch some, some off the wall footage of us doing it really as well, because it's quite funny as outtakes. Um, it's amazing what you can do with a rolling pin and plasticine. So the green, the green muscle here, cranial tibial, let's get excited. It's got this amazing tendon here. And I want you to really focus on this little brown piece here. That is an awesome bit of retinaculum. So it's fascia. It's got a great function as well. So if you have a look at the pictures here on the left is the lateral aspect. In the middle is a kind of craniolateral aspect. And then on the right side here, this is the medial aspect of the limb. So we try to do kind of a bit of a 3D round to get the impression of where. And you can see that the cranial tibial muscle actually wraps around onto the cranial surface of the tibia. So it passes to the cranial medial aspect of the crus, and then you can see here, hopefully, it's a thin, a thin, flat tendon that kind of goes medially around. It's retained here within this brown piece of plasticine, which represents a very, very important piece of fascia. And then it goes obliquely across the tarsus and it wraps around the back and it attaches to the plantar aspect, which we're going to then have a look at next in the next part of the page. So it actually wraps around and goes to the plantar aspect. I've got a great story that I've used for a long time for this, which I really enjoy. The trouble is probably slingback shoes aren't so fashionable now, but I used to have a great pair and love them. 
So the insertion, the insertion of the cranial tibial, it attaches to the plantar aspect of the metatarsal's base. Now the base on the metatarsal is at the proximal end. It it's not at the bottom as you would expect. So the base of your metatarsals and the base of your metacarpals on the forelimb, they're the proximal end of the metatarsus, which are like miniature. If you look at these, these they look like miniature long bones. That's two, that's three, that's four, and that's metatarsal five on the lateral aspect, because we're looking here on the plantar aspect, so we're looking from behind forward, that's one there. And so what happens is that flat tendon comes round obliquely across the tarsus, the hock, and attaches to the head, to the, sorry, it attaches to the base, not the head, the head's the other end, to the base of metatarsal two, and metatarsal one. So going to the slingback shoe, how I've described this is if you've got a slingback shoe, sorry for the chaps in it, so I'm not sure that they'll wear them, but I used to wear them in the 70s a lot. And um, the medial part of the slingback shoe, I want you to think about it. If you've ever looked at a slingback shoe or like a ballet shoe underneath, the slingback actually doesn't finish inside the shoe it goes round to the back so if you tip your shoe up you'll actually see the sling come round and it attaches to the underneath of the shoe so the cranial tibial represents the medial part of the sling back of the shoe so the medial part and it goes here and it turns around and it attaches to the underneath of the shoe and the lateral part there that's your perineus longus with a really long tendon that goes through the sulcus in the malleoli, your ankle bone for you, but it's a malleoli, the malleolus, the lateral malleolus in the dog. And it tucks round and that attaches to central, sorry, to tarsal four, where there's a hook for it to come round and to the bases of all the metatarsals. So between them, they make this amazing sling. And that means when the muscles contract, when cranial tibial contracts and shortens, it's going to pull the foot up, but it's attaching from behind. So we're just going to slide up. So I know a few people are joining us a little bit later, and this might look really unusual because there's no PDFs, there's no files. This is a page that you get to share immediately after using that resource. In fact, you could be on it live now because you can actually click on that K9 HS resource, cranial tibial muscle. It's your gateway to this page. And we've got more to come. So I've got some more exciting things to share on the page just below this. So we've now got this angle. So unfortunately, the skeleton on the left doesn't show the angle of the hock very well. The illustration on the right does a little bit more. So this angle of the hock, if we had a tendon just going across it and attaching, it's going to spring out. So we need something to retain it to optimize the movement um, sequence of this muscle group. So this is called the crural extensor retinaculum, and it, we've represented it here in brown. It's a wide strap. It's, kind, it's not level. It's sort of like a bit oblique, and it, it's a great design feature to retain the cranial tibial and the long digital extensor tendons, which are all together. They separate as four tendons at the uh, metatarsal, so they're all together um, like a piece of licorice all bound together or a piece of plasticine where you've got those bits. So it's all one tendon just crossing the, the tarsal, the tarsus, and we've got the cranial tibial coming and they're retained in there. So it really organizes that angle of pull and optimizes muscle function. Now the cranial tibial then turns around and goes to that plantar aspect, not so with the long digital extensor. So I'll just take you up to the next bit. So the next bit, because of the shape of the hock in the dog, we need another piece of retinaculum. And this bit of ret retinaculum is called the tarsal extensor retinaculum. Now, the cranial tibial is not within it. It's gone medial and gone to the plantar aspect. However, the long digital extensor tendon has to continue to the ends of the digits. And what this one is, it's not a broad, flat retinaculum. And this is really important for those tarsal injuries so you can really understand the structures if you're treating them for a hock issue. And my analogy for this one is it's like a lasso. So the lasso, it's like a piece of retinaculum here, the tarsal extens extensor retinaculum that kind of throws itself around and comes back and is attached. I think that's a really good analogy to understand the differences between these two retinaculums. So the cranial tibial is not in here. It's just for that long digital extensor and a few other muscles we're not talking about this evening. 
So I hope you really are um, enjoying this page presentation. Please give me some information back if you know, you're enjoying it because we want a more streamlined experience for you. I feel for the end user, for you guys, it's just so much more useful that you can then go to the page and um, go up and down it. It's a public resource that's open for you forever. And um, within it, we've launched our next announcement, our one shot inside K9HS. So we produce a whole range of different videos. The videos that we use in our level three, level four and level five, particularly the level four and level five um, diploma and advanced um, uh, certificate in canine hydrotherapy and treatment techniques are packed full of our canine technical videos or canine TVs. These are highly edited um, instructional manuals that show us working with the dogs in real time plus takes you to a workshop experience and breaks down the techniques step by step. And they've got a voiceover and they're very polished. So there are canine TVs and we put those in our courses. Then on YouTube, you can go and see our behind the scenes. They're edited. So these are edited pieces of footage with some music um, and I'm speaking in them and we're sharing some knowledge and skills and having a bit of fun. So it's like behind the scene processes. Now, the one shot inside K9HS is something totally different. This is raw footage. This is one shot. There's no editing, no, no voiceover, no music. It's basically clinical perspectives, looking at the anatomy and a few other things. So please do enjoy looking at this one shot inside K9HS. It's our first, so be kind. So we're still getting used to the lighting and, and working with the dogs, but we're going to completely pack well, I can't tell you yet, but the last announcement of today, but I'm going to completely pack this into our courses, but we're also going to offer it to you through another resource. So we're going to put these on our pages from now on as well. And I'm not going to play it now. So you can have a look at that later if you want to visit this page. So let's get back to cranial tibial. Right, so the fiber type, this tells us so much about how the biomechanics of this muscle works. So we know it's predominantly type two fast twitch muscle fibers. And we also know from EMG studies, the research shows that the neuromuscular activation of this muscle is only in the swing phase and it's only during walking and trotting. That's what they, where they've identified it. So all this information gives us the hypothesis that this is the muscle recruitment pattern for a tarsal flexor. So the cranial tibial muscle is a dedicated hock flexor and the hock flexor has to pay out while the hock extensor, which is your power sweep, which is your retraction works. Um, and also if we've got any issues with lack of range of motion with your hock flexion, it's definitely going to impact the working and athletic dogs extension and powering. The innovation of the cranial tibial muscle is innovated by the common fibular nerve. Now, when I learned my anatomy, it was called the common perineal nerve. They're just two names for the same structure. So don't get worried that there's some other structures you don't know about. So it's the common fibular nerve. And this is divided into superficial and deep. And the cranial tibial, which you can see by the green just there on this wonderful dog, which is a Bracco Italiano. Okay, and that's where the cranial tibial lies. And it's, it's supplied by the deep fibular nerve. So the deep branch of the fibular nerve, of the common fibular nerve. Always know what turns the muscle on because that's your recruitment. That's how, that's the proprioceptive system reaches the muscles and, tell, and orchestrates them what to do through their innovation. So you really need to know your innovation. So let's look at the actions of the cranial tibial. So the cranial tibial is a dedicated hock flexor. So it's a tarsal flexion is what's happening there. It also has a role in canine paw balance. We won't call it foot balance because they don't have feet, they have paws, so it's paw balance. So it contributes to rotating the ankle. On a human, think of it, so it's the tarsus in the dog. There is some rotation, lateral and medial. So it rotates the plantar aspect. So put your hand face down to the table in front of you, okay? And think of that as the top of the paw of the dog and then turn your, plant, the bottom, your palm of your hand, turn it laterally, okay? And then turn it medially. So you understand that. So if you see where the sling back shoe attaches to, okay, 
it's going to rotate it laterally, all right? But the plantar surface, okay, is going to face medially. Now there's a bit of a mix up. So it's rotating the plantar aspect laterally, but the plantar aspect will face medially, but it's rotating it laterally. So again, get your hand, so get your hand here, because it confuses a lot of people. Your sling back shoe is coming on the medial aspect, the sling back part of the shoe is coming there. As the muscle contracts, it's going to rotate the plantar aspect. It's going to rotate laterally, so it's going to face medially, so it's shortened. And then perineus longus does the opposite. And what this is all about is about poor balance. And it's fantastic for them when they're changing direction to optimize um, the poor in natural balance stance and motion. So that's a very small part. And you would make sure you've got that facility by looking at your range of motion work when you're working with the hop. So my biggest clinical tip, there are so many dogs with mild hock injuries that are missed. It's really, really common. You will never miss a major hock injury, but mild hock injuries where the hock doesn't flex quite as fully. So always check left and right. Can I just say, be really mindful if you're working with an older dog. As an older person myself, I'm stiffer. I don't have end range of motion. So don't push to end range of motion on an elderly dog or an injured dog because you will do more harm than good. But you need to explore the quality of that movement and the amount of movement in respect for working with the dog, not working on the dog. So I hope you found that useful. So just scrolling down the page, which you've got access to, um, this is our page, we own it, but we share it with you. Um, and I really appreciate um, if you respect that. We'd really welcome your feedback on this new style. So I hope you like this page style rather than, than a PDF format because everybody's using that. And I just wanted to give you something that you could then have afterwards, relate to it and streamline this experience of sharing information between us. If you want to share any thoughts, if you want to give me some um, feedback personally, please email me at info at k9hscourses.com. That comes direct to me. Um, you can check out our YouTube channel as well. I've linked all of these, so they're live links within the page. And if you like those videos, please subscribe and press like, um, because that gives us the motivation to keep doing those. Because each one of our videos that we put on YouTube, you know, the behind the scenes, and these kind of presentations takes us days, days and days to put together. So it's not something that's quick, but we're very motivated to sharing with you um, if you're feeling it's useful for you. And now the big announcement that I'm so excited and I've been busting to tell so many people, we've been super busy. So we've listened to you. And what we've done is we're building a resource library. It's gonna be a canine resource library that is um, comp composed of five integrated canine bite-sized hubs covering everything canine. It's approved, we've got approval um, um, in our format, so it's approved CPD, it's multi-formatted. So for someone like me, I'm very left-handed and dyslexic, I struggle with just reading information. So we have packed it full of one shot inside Canine HS. Um, live Q&A, we're going to run a live Q&A event, we're going to have in conversations, we're going to have webinar replays, it's going to be information if you want more than just this page, if you want to go deeper and have more experiences like this, this is where we're going to sit it all, it will have scripted facts, we're going to have articles, journals, and we're going to release all our clinical tools and techniques gradually over time. So. We've listened to you and created this on the back of the emails and messages that I've been overwhelmed with this year. And it's going to be great because it's gonna be at your fingertips and give you power over your CPD choices. So if you want to know about when we launch it, because it's coming up soon, really soon, if you want to know, please, you can just go and register there and we'll make sure that you get the message first the day, well, the moment it's launched, you will know. So if that's something that you're interested in and want more of this, please do go and register so we don't miss you out on our emails to let you know it's open.
So I'd like to really thank you very much for giving me your time this evening. I hope you found it useful. Please go away and have a look at the page and examine cranial tibial. It's a brilliant muscle. It's often missed. It's superficial and lies just under the skin. We can do so much to facilitate really useful hock movement in the dog. Remember the hock extensors are the key for powering, but without the flexors, that arrangement doesn't work satisfactorily. So it's definitely a muscle to go and hunt out and explore on your dogs carefully. So take care, thank you so much for your feedback and I look forward to our next Crowdcast. What we're going to do, we're going to come back to the bite-sized canine anatomy for sure, but next month, the most exciting opportunity, I'm going to do canine, proprioceptive exercises. We're going to show you some techniques and I hope you can attend. It's going to be packed full of information and I'm really excited about that. Then the month after, we're going to jump back into the bite-sized canine anatomy. So I'm going to say goodbye to you all now. Thank you so much. I've really, really appreciated. Um, oh, I'm just going to stop that. I'm just cancelling that. I'm jumping out of there. I've just noticed there's ask a question. I'm so sorry. Paul Watts, I'm so sorry, Paul. Just saw that at the last moment. I was so excited about the library. Right, so Paul, there's a question there. Let me read it out. I've seen some twitching in the cranial tibial area in a patient before. Could this be something like a shin splint that we see in humans or I'm going, don't relate canine to human in any way. That's the problem. Social media and people who have experiences with other species bring them in the dog. So it's nothing to do with shin splints. But if you've seen something going on cranial tibial like that, that fasciculation, that's usually fatigue. You need to explore gastrocnemius as well and look at the relationship and also look at the hock range of motion. I hope that helps, Paul. So if you can just let me know. Um, and I'm really sorry I jumped to saying goodbye. I nearly ended the broadcast then and missed the question, which would have been terrible. So thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Look after yourselves. And